welcome back everybody. That little frog was a lot of fun to build and too bad I haven't had a chance to actually fish with it. Today I'm going to follow a suggestion from one of you guys and build a 5 inch suspending jerkbait. And if you're new to the channel, my name is Franco. I'm a professional engineer, a lure designer and lure maker, and an avid fisherman. And I make these videos to share some of the tricks and techniques I've come up with and learned, and add a little bit of physics and engineering to the art of lure making. Let's get started. Now, I'd like to start by clarifying terms, because a jerkbait might be something else to you somewhere else in the world, or maybe somewhere else in this country. But what I'm talking about today, what we're going to build today, is a lipped crankbait that is suspending or very slowly rising or very slowly sinking. The idea is you crank it down to depth where you think the fish are, are hanging out and then you let it sit. It should suspend relatively still and then every few seconds you give it a hard twitch and that makes the lure erratically move and sound its rattles. It's really effective and it's effective both in freshwater and saltwater. So we're going to make ours suspend in salt water or at least be very slowly floating. I don't want it to sink. I want to be able to crank it down and if I leave it for a while it'll move away from the grass and anything to hang it up. Let me show you what I think it should look like. So this is a very typical slope back crankbait sort of shape and the reason I have this sort of pregnant porgy sort of body shape is because I want to make space for rattle balls and I want those rattle balls to be relatively low in the body so there'll be a cavity here that I carve out on the inside of the lure. I want the lure to have a big action so when you pull it it has a big sweep back and forth so I'm going to have the tie on eye really close to the root of the bib and maybe out just a little bit. We'll have a single belly hook so we'll have the hanger slightly forward of where I would normally put it, but I want it to miss the body cavity inside. And then we'll have a typical tail hook arrangement like you see on most any other lure. The body cavity will be relatively centered on the lure, and I'll use BBs as my rattle ball. The angle on the bib is going to be slightly shallower than I usually do, so instead of around 45 to 50, this is going to be around 60 to 65 degrees. That'll get this lure down to depth where I want it, relatively quickly so I don't have to reel it too far from where I originally cast it. In an effort to sort of continue to demystify how to choose wood to make your lures, I'm choosing a ruler and it was I think a dollar sixty nine and I could probably make I don't know probably five or six lures out of this thing. It's right at a quarter of an inch thick which is about 0.6 centimeters and it's right at one and three eighths in width which is about three and a half centimeters and that should do perfectly for this lure because I'm going to build it in two halves. This way I can create the uh, cavity for the rattle on the inside really easily by splitting the two halves, carving it out and then adding those rattles and putting it all back together. The trick is going to be calculating the exact amount of weight that I can add to this lure and still have it suspend or really just slightly float. And like I said, it's going to be 5 inches long, and that's about 12.7 centimeters. And the deepest part will be about 1 and a quarter inches, maybe a little less than that, maybe a little closer to 1 and 8. The thickness of the body looking down on it will be double the thickness of the ruler, obviously. And I want the thickest part just forward of the center. On this drawing that's 16 inches right here, I'm putting it at the 9 inch mark from the tail. Otherwise, it's going to have a relatively typical taper front and back. This is a little crude. It'll probably be a little less chunky in the front than I've drawn here. All right, first thing we need is to cut two pieces five inches long. And it's nice that the measurements are already there. Now I'm going to glue them together temporarily with some contact adhesive. I just let the glue tack over a little bit and then we'll just fold them together. All right, I like to draw on a piece of blue masking tape. Just makes it easier to see the lines. Now I'll mark out where I want the widest point, which is just forward of the center point. That'll be three inches. All right, we're ready to cut it out.
I've gone ahead and sketched in some lines, just some guidelines for the taper in the back and then the front. So I don't need the tape anymore. And I'll put some guidelines in for the round over. And I won't necessarily grind down to these lines. They're just there so I can eyeball for symmetry. All right, this shouldn't take very long. The wood is soft and I'm not really taking much meat off, so. So you can see I start off by sort of getting all the saw marks and smoothing out the curves a little bit and then I take down the ends on both ends and now I'm starting to do the chamfer here to start the round over on the top and I'll do the same on the belly. I'll probably take a lot more on top than I do on the bottom. I need that fatness to have a nice open cavity in there for the rattle. There you go. You can see how the bottom sort of is rounded here and rounded up front, but still kind of blocky in the middle. I'm going to do the rest by hand so I don't overdo it anywhere. So chasing the symmetry on these things can be a little bit of a pain in the butt because you take a little off one side and then you need to take a little off the other side. But you got to be careful not to get too carried away and look for as good a symmetry as you can get without taking too much material off. And if you look at the front, you can see the symmetry is pretty good. Same with the back. So I'd give myself a B plus on this. Next step is to drill the eye sockets and cut in the slot for the bib. All right, I've got the lure in the jaws. I'm trying to align the bib angle with this vertical surface on the jaws. This way I have something to guide myself by. And I think that's pretty close. And since the sides are still kind of flat, I should be able to cut a slot that's nicely aligned and hopefully nice and square to the body. All right, there it is. Pretty nice square cut. And since I'm going to be using this circuit board lip, I don't have to cut it any thicker. It should just slip right in there. Yeah, that should work. On second thought, just looking at this bib, I think I want something a little bigger. Not as big as this, but something with a little more acreage on there. So the bib has a little bit more authority on the action of this lure. And I think this square bib is going to work just fine. Alright, so the next thing I want to do is give this thing a really light clear coat. And I'm going to go ahead and drill some little temporary holes where the tie on eye is going to be and the tail hook is going to be so I have a way to hold on to this thing. Now I'm just going to put some little temporary wire loops on this thing so I can hold it and get some clear coat on there. I don't want to put too much on there but I definitely want to fill in the grain. All right it's in the chamber I just need to turn the lights on and give it about 30 minutes. And while we wait, this is a perfect time to answer the question of the week. And I wanna answer questions that have been coming in that just general questions on the UV Cure resin that I've been using. What I use, its durability, and how to recoat with it. So first of all, what I use. It's a lot easier for me to just send you to my Amazon store because I try to keep an updated link to the materials that I use. If it's a material that I like to use and I'm willing to recommend it, it'll be in the Amazon store. And it's a lot easier for you to just grab that link than for me to try to explain to you which one of the Chinese brands to buy. Now, the other question I get a lot of is how durable is this stuff? You know, will it hold up to a bite? Now, nothing but glass will hold up to a big bite. That's just the truth. You're not gonna build a lure that's gonna last forever, especially if you're fishing for the big stuff out in blue water, your mackerel, tuna, that kind of fish is just not gonna be kind to your lure. You're gonna get it crunched. But it does hold up really well to sunlight, abrasion, and the average fish bite. It's at least as good as any finish I've ever seen on any factory lure. And if you don't mind having your lure look a little bulky, you can add a lot of layers and create a much tougher skin on that lure. The other question I get is, do I experience flaking or chipping with this stuff? And I really don't. I don't really see a whole lot of that. If you get a big bite and you get a puncture wound, I'm not sure you'll be able to see this little 
puncture wound right there. That was a big blue fish that hit this thing and I'm lucky that that's all it did. But you can see if you look close just at and around it, it does want to delaminate a little bit, but that really is nothing. And I wouldn't recoat this thing until it had maybe 20 or 30 of those bite marks. But if you're experiencing this stuff chipping on you or peeling up, then there's probably something else going on. It's probably your preparation of the surface below it. If it's peeling up and you're taking up the paint with it, then your paint isn't sticking to your lure. So either you didn't prepare that surface correctly or you didn't allow that paint to dry enough. Now, if, if the clear coat is peeling up and leaving the paint behind, then it's not adhering to the paint. And so you probably need to think about using a mid coat, something between the paint and the UV resin. I use this stuff. It's a water-based protective finish. You can put it on pretty thin and it dries pretty quickly. I usually add two coats over the paint, let it dry for at least an hour or more if you have the time. And then you can apply the clear coat directly over that. It adheres better. It has much fewer flaws in it, like fish eyes and that sort of thing. And it tends to smooth out and self-level really well on that stuff. If you can't get this stuff where you live, then you might want to try some top coat, some clear top coat from uh, an airbrush paint supplier. This stuff works okay. It seals the paint pretty well. I've had pretty good luck with it. It isn't as good as the Minwax though. Now, if your second coat of clear coat is peeling from the first coat, then you didn't prep the first coat well enough. What you need to do is at the very least, and this is what I do, is I clean it with denatured alcohol. Now, a lot of people will mistakenly think that isopropyl and denatured alcohol will work the same. They won't. Isopropyl has a lot of water in it and denatured alcohol is a much better solvent and will clean it really well. Now you can do sand and clean if, you, if you're only gonna use isopropyl alcohol. That's what you need to do. You need to sand it with some very fine grit sandpaper wipe it down with alcohol and then give it that second coat. Now, if you're just getting into using UV resin, I really highly recommend you go watch the playlist that I have on all the videos that I've done on this particular topic. There's a lot of information in there and I'll go ahead and link that uh, in the description. Otherwise, if you have other questions, certainly ask those and I'll address them either individually or on another one of these. All right, let's get back to the build. All right, it's been long enough. All right, that's a pretty nice, Thin clear coat. So we're going to figure out the volume through uh, the displacement method. And we'll use a scale and I've got this plastic container I'm going to use for water. And I'm just going to fill this about three quarters of the way full with just regular tap water. Now I like putting a drop of a mild detergent. This is just like hand wash soap. You know, just put a couple little drops and what that does it just breaks the surface tension so we don't get a bunch of bubbles in there. And with the water on the scale, I'll turn the scale on and that'll give me a zero with everything already on there. Now I'm going to take the lure and just submerge it in the water, making sure not to touch the bottom or the sides of the container. And then I'll take the reading from the scale and it's 26.47. All right, now we can split the lure in half. Oh, there it goes. All right, now we can start to work on the inside of this thing. I'm going to draw out the, the cavity and where the uh, wire harness is going to be. I'm going to try to transfer it to the other half using some of this packing tape. So I'll just stick it on there and then I'll carefully trim so it's the exact shape of the lure. Then I'll trace everything so it's on this plastic tape. I'll peel the tape off, being careful not to rip it. Stick it down to this piece of wax paper. Then I flip the wax paper over and stick another piece of tape on the other side. And now I can trace again. And now I'll peel this one up and stick it on the other side. That should give me the exact opposite of this. And there you go. Now I've got both sides with the same markings and I can just run a little carving blade through there and get it marked permanently. I've got them carved in pretty well and I hope you can see it's about the depth of the BB. A little less, but that's fine. That'll give it plenty of room to rattle around. We gotta make the harness. So I'll start off with the nose eye. And that goes just like that. And then it's just a matter of making the bends. And then bending the eye for the belly hook. All right, I've got the harness in there. I've glued it in just so I wouldn't have to mess with it. But we still have to weigh all this and the harness is part of the package. My hands are full of crazy glue. All right, so here are the hooks and the split rings and the bib we're gonna put on it. And the lure body with its uh, harness in it, we got 14.07. We're trying to get to around 26.5 grams. 
to be right at neutral. But we might go a little lighter than that just to have it floating a little like we said. All right, let's see how many BBs we can carry. I think that's as many as I want to put in there. I don't want to crowd it so much that it won't rattle. So that's right at 19.58. So we need about seven grams. With these two split shots, we've got 25.16. If I add one more BB, I've got 25.5, which puts me at about one gram below the target weight. So that'll give me a little bit of weight to add paint and a clear coat and get us really close to suspending. I wanna coat the inside of the rattle chamber with something that's gonna make it nice and hard so when the BBs rattle around, they make a little bit more of a sharp noise. So I'm gonna use just some really thin super glue and with a Q-tip, I'm going to just put a bunch in here and spread it. Get it to soak into the grain and form a nice sort of shell-like layer. I would already done one coat on this side and that should do it. I decided to go with three smaller split shots, but with the same weight. All right, let's give it a shot. All right, it looks pretty good. Pretty nicely aligned. I just can't forget to put the rattle balls in before I glue. All right, I have the BBs in there and I've got a couple of little magnets here and I just wanna make sure those ball bearings don't roll around and get up into the glue. So I'm gonna try to keep them centered with the magnets. The idea is not to get any glue into the BBs. It's just a matter of waiting for this thing to set and we can move on to probably paint. All right, it's been a lot longer than 20 minutes. I went in for lunch and there was a tornado warning and so I spent the last three hours in the house waiting to see what's gonna happen with that. The important part, so actually that's not the important part. The important part is this thing gonna be the right weight because I really am a little bit concerned about how well I actually weighed this thing in water. I don't know that I took my time to get a good accurate reading, so I'm a little worried. At this point though, it's sealed for the most part and I can hang the hooks on it and put it in the tank. Should I do it or should I just wait till I'm finished painting it and take what we get? I'm gonna have to think about that, see which way we go. But while I think about it, I'm gonna go ahead and sand back the little bit of ooze out and give the whole body a light sanding too. All right, let's go ahead and do it. Let's find out where we are with this thing. Now I've put the, uh, the dive bib on it and I've hung the hook off of it. And what I want is for it to be a little floatier than, uh, than it will be at the end. Because remember, I still have to add eyes, paint, and clear coat. So as long as it doesn't sink. If it sinks, well, that sucks. See what happens. Oh, it looks almost perfect. That's pretty doggone good. It floats a little more than I want it. But I think with a couple clear coats on it, it's going to do the trick. All right, so most everybody has some technique to deal with uh, adding epoxy to a lure that you've already had, had added weight to. And I think a lot of people have the misconception that you can just weigh the lure before and the lure after. And if you add a gram and a half or two grams of clear coat to it, then that's the amount of negative buoyancy. And that's not the case. Because when you're adding weight to the outside, you're also adding volume. When you add weight to the inside, you don't change any volume. So you actually are adding that full weight to the negative buoyancy of the lure. But since the specific gravity of epoxy is only about 1.1, that means it's only about 10% greater than the weight of water. So when you add 1.1 grams of clear coat on this, you're only really adding one tenth of a gram of negative buoyancy. So it has very little effect. And that's why you rarely see me included in a calculation. But when you're trying to tweak something in really tight like this, you gotta kind of think about it. And even with that, I really just left about a gram. So in the end, adding clear coat is somewhat of a surprise ending, but usually not very dramatic and I don't worry about it too much. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this thing and paint it black, give it another really fine clear coat because I wanna start my paint job with the liquid chrome from Molotow. Thank you. 
And we're ready to finish this lure. All right, that's a pretty nice finish. Let's get started with the paint. And now for the mid coat to seal the paint so we can be ready for the clear coat. And to speed up the drying process, I'm just gonna stick it in the little oven here at about 150 degrees for about 20 minutes and that should get us ready for clear coat. All right, I gave it about an hour. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. Not sure if the camera is picking up just the subtlety of colors. I think it'll look better in the sun. Before I put in the bib, I'm gonna take this tie-on eye and squeeze it down so it sort of sticks out just another millimeter or so. And I won't be able to do that when the bib's in there. The idea is the farther out onto the bib the tie-on eye is, the bigger the action you're gonna get. And I'm just doing it with some small pliers. And there you go. You can see it's just slightly elongated. All right, I know all you lure builders out there are wondering, well, what's it weigh now? Let's see. The hook's on and we're at 29.2. That's a couple of grams greater than before the clear coat in the eyes and the paint and all that stuff. So you can see that there's a substantial change in weight. But the question is, does that really result in a substantial difference in buoyancy? So let's go ahead, put it back in a tank and see if it behaves different. In other words, does it sink? All right, let's give it a shot. Any bets out there? Will it sink or will it act exactly like it did before it added all that weight? Pretty much the way it was before. Still rises a little faster than I wanted to. Make a minor change, go up to the next size split ring. And that should actually make it perfect. Let's see what it does now with the new split rings. Look at that, perfect. Push it down, sits for a second, and then rises really slowly. All right, so I know that I said that I wanted it to behave that way, but in salt water. But from experience, I know that if I go to the next size treble hook up, in this case, number twos, I'll get a perfect behavior in salt water. It's just a matter of experience. But if you guys out there have found other little hacks, share them in the comments. I'm sure everybody would appreciate it. All right, enough yakking. Let's go down to the dock and put this thing in the water. All right, here it is. Let's see how it does. I'm excited about this. I gotta be careful. It's only got an eight pound test leader so i don't want to get a bite all right so it looks like it's coming back straight that's hard to believe let's take a look at it close up looks great oh man what a nice action oh i can really hear the rattle man i can't believe i don't have to tune this thing let's try to get some underwater shots
right, guys, that'll do it for this video. There'll be a slideshow right after this. I want to say thank you for everybody who watched this far. And if you're getting something out of these videos, don't forget to subscribe and leave me a thumbs up. I'm thinking about doing a master class on weight and balance. Let me know if there's any interest out there and maybe we'll do that pretty soon. All right, until then, I'll see you guys on the next video.